Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where I write a game engine from scratch. One of the most important aspects, if not the most important aspect, of any software program is the user experience, provided that it was made to be used by a human, of course. Although it seems that we collectively have forgotten about this fact, if we look at the state of most commercial software we use on a daily basis, we all agree that we prefer programs that won't make us want to cut off our own limbs with a rusty saw, because that would make for a less agonizing experience. I can think of three properties that in my opinion make for a pleasant user experience. First, stability and robustness, i.e. don't crash and don't have bugs. The second item is intuitive user interface, so we don't have to read a lot of documentation to figure out how it works. And the third one is aesthetics, which is the look and feel of the software. This one is of course subject to personal taste, but at least we can agree that we all like consistency and order in the user interface. This item also overlaps with the second item in that the developer can communicate the intended use of an element through how it looks, for example with certain colors and shapes. So far in this video series I have been concerned mainly with the first and a little bit with the second item. The purpose of these blue episodes is to work on the third one which is the aesthetics of the level editor. Here I'll try to design a user interface that I think is okay to look at and will preferably give us a clue about the functionality as well. So let's start by looking at the effort of resolution necessary to the achievement of this purpose. The first thing I'd like to do is to choose a limited number of colors that I'll be using for the editor and the purpose of that is to give the editor a consistent look across all its parts. In general I like darker themes for graphics software better because then I can differentiate between different colors more easily than when there are light user interface elements around what I'm looking at. Therefore I picked six shades of gray. And there are six because nobody should feel the need for more than six shades of grey. Technically, disabled font and font colors are also shades of grey, and that would make it eight shades of grey. But that's really the maximum number of shades of grey that anyone should be comfortable with. Otherwise, it would be weird, wouldn't it? And of course, you can go darker or lighter by starting with a darker or a lighter shade of grey. But keep in mind that the human visual system has a nonlinear response to intensity of light. So for example here, if you look at the blue curve, you can see that if we increase the intensity from 0 to 25%, the perceived increase in intensity is more than 50%. And that means that we can differentiate a lot of shades of gray just in the first quarter of the intensity value. Whereas at the other end, at the bright end, when we increase the value of intensity from 75% to 100%, the perceived increase in intensity is just 20% or less. And that means that there are a lot less values allocated in this region that we can differentiate between. So that's something to keep in mind when you are designing your user interface and choosing the colors. In addition, I also have colors for red, green, and blue, and these are a bit less saturated than the pure red, green, and blue, as you can see here. And I think these are a bit less harsh on the eye, and that's why I chose them to be less saturated. And I have this uh, orange color, yellow orange color that I'll be using for warnings. This selection color is obviously for selections, like in, if you have a list of items in the list box and the background color of those selected items will be this color. So let's put this in a resource dictionary so we can use them in the editor. Here in Visual Studio, I'll just add another resource dictionary. And I can add this right away to the app XAML as well, so we can use it everywhere in the editor. 
And here I'll just add the colors. So here for each of those colors, I'll also define a solid color brush so I can use them with any control in WPF. And the reason that I'm not using this color code directly in the solid color brush is because I want to be able to refer to these colors separately as well in, for example, a gradient color brush. So I'll be able to combine different colors later on. Okay, these are all the colors, and now we can go ahead and use them everywhere in the editor. And the first change I'd like to make is to the window style. Uh, I want to have a different window style than we have right now, of course, because it's just the standard window uh, style, which is uh, white and doesn't use any of the colors that we just defined. And to change this, I'll just add a new style for all windows in the control templates. So right now I just changed the background color of the window. And if I would use this style here right now, we would see the background color change. So as you can see here, the background color changed, but I don't have any control over how the title bar looks. And to do that, there is something that's called a window Chrome property that I can uh, add to this window style. And that allows me to change how this title bar looks. So going back to Visual Studio, I can go here in the style and add that window Chrome.
Okay, using this window Chrome property, I can tell the window to have a zero radius corner, so we don't have rounded corners. It will use a default uh, window resize border thickness, so we can resize the window. No glass frame thickness, as a glass frame around a standard window. We don't want to see those. And the caption height is just a height of the title bar and this is also the width or the height actually of the area that I can grab with my mouse to move a window and we don't want to have edges around the client area the client area is everything in a window except the title bar and the edges so those non-client frame edges uh, we don't want to have those and these arrow buttons are just the standard close, maximize, minimize buttons in a, in a title bar. And we are not using those because I'm going to make and use my own buttons for the title bar. So right now, if I would open a window or start the application. Now, indeed, our title bar is gone. I can still grab the top of the window and move it. But now the client area with our controls and everything overlaps with, uh, with the title bar, basically, or the caption area. So I'm going to separate those. So we have a clear, distinct title bar with three buttons here to close it and maximize and minimize it and the rest of our user interface. For that, I'm going to uh, write a template for the window to define what goes where. The window is basically a border with other stuff in it. But this border has a trigger that whenever the window is maximized, that it will use some other border thickness than when it is not maximized. And that's just to make the window fill the entire screen whenever it's maximized. Otherwise, it wouldn't. Or it would go outside the boundary of the screen. Okay, next I'll go ahead and tell the window what else should be in, the, in this border. So obviously there should be the content of the window that we want to display and the caption bar or the title bar with these buttons. This is everything I have to do to display the content of the application basically it's in the adorner decorator so we have an adorner layer on top and everything that we want to display in the user interface is displayed through this content presenter and everything else that i am going to do has to do with the title bar and the buttons So here goes the title on the left side and on the right side, I want to display three buttons.
This is a close button and it is just a cross, basically. And this is just a line that goes from top left to bottom right and the other one goes from the top right to the bottom left. So we have a cross. But the default color of this path is black or anything that the system is using for the font color, actually, which is black. And we have to tell this window to use the font color for that we defined actually, which is lighter. And to do that, I'm just going to uh, set a resource for the doc panel so we can define different things here. Here I define the style for path, and I'm going to define another style that applies to all the buttons in this doc panel. Now that I defined this style for the button, I also have to implement this event handler for the close button, which just closes the window. Because I'm using a button in a template for the window, I need to get what the template parent is of that button. Remember, the sender is my button, basically. And the template parent of that button is my window. And that's how I get a reference to that instance of window. And then I close it here. Now we can see that we have this title bar now with a primal editor title displayed and everything else is underneath. And we also have this button to close it. But if I click on it, it doesn't work because I need to tell the window Chrome properties to actually listen to these buttons instead of its own buttons that we disabled, right? So if I go back here, Here I told the Windows Chrome instance to not use its own buttons. But I also have to tell it what buttons to use then, right? So here in the button style, I can tell it that it should use these buttons. And now if I click on that, um, on that button, on the close button, it should it will close the window like so. And I'm gonna go ahead and define the other two buttons for maximizing and minimizing the window. So these are the two buttons for restore or maximize and restore the window and the minimize button. So let's implement these event handlers. 
Again, I'm going to get the window instance of the button. And now we should have three buttons on top of the window if we open it. Yeah, here they are. And, and they work as well, of course. Now, one more thing I have to do is to define the look of those buttons as well because now they have this default button look Here is a template for the button, what it should contain. It's just a border with the background and border colors that we defined here. And its content is displayed with this content presenter. And now I want to have a trigger so that whenever I go over this button with the mouse, it will change color. And now all I have to do is to base the style that we defined here in the doc panel on this one that we just wrote. So it will inherit these properties and the template as well. Now we can see three buttons displayed here and they look nice. Whenever I go over them with the mouse, they change color as well. And yeah, that works fine. If we double click on the title bar, it will also maximize the window. So that's good. I think I'm done with how a window looks. And 
I want to make another one for our dialog windows as well. Because now if I open, uh, start the application, then this dialog box uh, doesn't have the same style. And it's basically just a copy paste of what I just did, but then with only a close button instead of th three buttons here. That's the only difference. So I just copy and paste this. And I'll name this one dialog style. And all I have to do now is to remove these two buttons and also add this style to any dialog box that will use this style. So for example, in the game project, project browser dialog, I can set its style here. And now it also has this dark background and one close button. All right. Now for the rest of uh, the UI design, I want just to start from the beginning, which is project browser dialog and define its look here. So it will also have a dark theme using those colors that we wrote here. First, I would like to restyle these toggle buttons to look a bit nicer. And for that, I'm not going to write the style from scratch. I can just right click this and extract its template. Uh, so here I can edit a copy. I can click apply to all. So it's applied to all toggle buttons that I'm using in this uh, user control or in this window, basically. And it will use it in this document, so that's good. And there are a lot of stuff that I don't need, so I can just uh, get rid of them right away. I don't need a focus visual style. And all these colors, because we have our own colors now. These can all go. I want them to have a transparent background color. So here in this template, I'll just say how the content of this toggle button should be displayed. And in this case, I just want to have a text block. Okay, so here I, I have the text block with a nice subtle drop shadow effect. And next we have to define the triggers for this toggle button. So we can define what happens when we go over it with a mouse or push or select it. Uh, these toggle buttons don't have a is defaulted. Um, or don't need a is defaulted style, so we can delete these. And then for is mouse over and the other uh, ones, I can define a trigger.
here I defined three triggers for whenever the button is, or this toggle button is disabled, it should have this darker gray color. And if it's checked, that means we have selected one of these two, open project or create project. The one that's selected will be white. And whenever I'm going over one of those buttons with a mouse and the one that I'm going over is not checked, then it will become brighter because on default they have this darker color and then they'll be brighter whenever I go over them with a mouse. And whenever they are selected, they'll be entirely white. So that's their brightest state. Now I can already test it. It's hard to see, but they have a drop shadow. I can see that the one that's selected is not white, so I have to fix it. But everything else seems to be working. Let's see what's going on. First, I want to have also open project and create project in uppercase. I think that looks a bit nicer. Okay, I of course have the, instead of the foreground, I have the background here. So I should use foreground for this. It was again a copy paste error. I tend to make a lot of those actually, so. Okay, now it's working. Open project is selected and create project is also selected now. So those become white and if I go over the one that's not selected with my mouse, then it will have the font color. It's slightly less bright than full white. Next, I'm going to work on these controls for open project and create project themselves. So they also will be darker. So I'll open new project first. And what I would like to do is just to put all of these on a border to give it a bit more depth. As we can see here, the color of these labels or the, the text blocks is black. So I want to define a style that I can use to set every text block in the user interface to the right font color that we are using. So going back to control templates, on top I'll just define a style for the text blocks in the user interface. So whenever I use this text block style, I'll have this editor font brush color for its foreground color, and it will be vertically centered and its default horizontal alignment is to the left. Now I can go here back to new project view and use that style. I want to give this error message a red color, and luckily we defined our own red color. I'm going to use that one. And next, I would like to change how these text boxes look. I'm going to write a style for those here in control templates as well.
This selection brush is what the color will be whenever we select the text in the text box. So if this works, then it will be applied to all the text boxes in the application. So let's see if that is the case. Yeah. Now we have darker text boxes. I'll define the style for our buttons and list box later on. But first I want to finish working on this project browser dialog. Now I have to do the same basically for open project view as well. So let's open that one. Again, I'll put this in the same border. So that's just a copy paste from what I just did. And I'll give this border a nice drop shadow in the project browser dialog. All right, it's looking nicer already. I can see this error message is a bit out of alignment. I think I can just uh, go here and do this. Yeah, that's better. And you know what? Let's have some fun. I would like to go and animate all of these so I can, whenever I select one of the two, they will just shift to the left and right. So going back to these event handlers, whenever I click on uh, these buttons, then instead of just setting their margin directly, I can make this an animation. So it will go to the left and right. Here I can define two functions that will let me animate to the open project state or create project state. So here in create project, whenever the create uh, project button is checked, that means that we are going from the create project to open project. So we have to animate to open project. And whenever we are going from the open project to create project, we animate to create project. And during the animation, I want to disable the one control that is active at that moment. So in this case, for example, the create project button is checked. That means that create or the new project view is active. So I want to disable it so the user can't do anything while the animation is playing. So new project view should be disabled. And open project view should be enabled. And when we are going from open project to new project, it should be the other way around. So open project is disabled and the new project is enabled. Now let's implement these two methods. Now here I can say what exactly to animate and how. So first here in project browser dialog, I'm going to define a couple of more elements that will animate nicely whenever we click on these buttons. First, I'll have a separation line here.
Okay, now I have this nice line that has a gradient to it. It goes from transparent to disabled font color and back to transparent. And I want to have a kind of spotlight background to these buttons that will animate whenever I click on one of those. So it's uh, like a background lighting. Okay, here I can see that spotlight thing that I just made, and I want to animate this to the left and right whenever I click one of these toggle buttons now. And after that animation is done, I want to animate the entire uh, user control for open project or create project. So going back to project, browser dialog. Now I can make animations for that highlight object. Here I define an animation that goes from 400 to 200. That's just a canvas coordinate of this uh, highlight I just made. And here I said that whenever that animation is completed, I want to animate the browser content itself. The browser content is, of course, the part that contains new project and open project controls. Let's see, I think I'm missing a parenthesis here. Right. And then I can do the same for animate to create project, which is going to the other direction. And I guess that's it. That's all I have to do to animate these. Let's see if that works. Yeah.
Okay, I, I think the way it stops at the end, the animation is too sudden. That makes it a bit uh, too, too chunky for my taste. I want it to ease in and out of the animation. And fortunately for that, we have the easing functions that we can use. So here I can uh, here create an easing, uh, a variable or a field that contains the easing function. And we can look up easing functions, of course, uh, here, WPF easing functions. And we have a lot of them, so we have bouncing ones and circular and cubic. So depending on what you want to do, you can choose one of these uh, easing functions. And they also have, uh, I think, their formula here. You can see what they exactly do. So that's quite a good documentation on those easing functions. Uh, for me, in this case, I'm going to use the cubic ease because I think that's the one that fits the, the this particular animation best. So I want the animation to ease in and out. So it will start slow and accelerate and then slow down again towards the end of animation. So as we can see here, we have easing modes, and I want to ease. I want to have ease in and ease out in one animation. So I'm going to have an easing mode of ease in out. Now for each of these animations that I just uh, made here, I can set their easing function. Yeah, that looks a bit better now. One more thing I'd like to do is to put more distance between these two controls. So I, during the animation, I don't want to see them both in the frame. I want to see this one go away and the other one come in right after that. Now it means that the distance between the two is 800 more, so I can I have to add that to this value. So it's going to be 600, 1600. There is also something going on here. Whenever I click this create project for the first time, then some flickering happens. You see that? I don't know what is exactly causing that. So let's investigate. Okay, I forgot to remove these, uh, of course. <laughs> we have no animations, so we don't have to set the margins explicitly.
And I think also the height of these things aren't correct now. I think if I would remove this extra margin, then yeah, this top part will be smaller and everything will fit um, nicely. Let's see if that helped. Great. Okay. I think this is good enough for now. And uh, the only thing we have still to do is to change the style for the list boxes in our application and have new styles for the buttons as well. And that's something that I'm going to do next time. And also next time, I'm going to create a couple of controls that would make it easier for us to input numbers and vectors, like three component and four component vectors, like positions and rotations and anything, maybe colors that have red, green, blue, and transparency channels. Those have four channels or four components. So I'll make a control uh, for inputting those numbers. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please feel free to like and subscribe. If you join me on Patreon, you'll get access to the code on GitHub so you don't have to type everything over from the video. Plus there are also other nice goodies and rewards exclusive to my Patreon supporters. Please use the link in the video description to check them out. I hope to see you next time. Until then, take care and happy game engineering.